Many people suggest that we all believe something. So maybe it's more important not to say the phrase, just believe or have faith, but that it's more important to speak of the object of our faith or the one in whom our faith rests. And so we would say, in the season of Easter, again proclaiming that Jesus, who was crucified, though perfect, is raised from the dead. He is the Son of God. He is victorious. But we would say then that we invite that our faith be in Jesus. For He is the only one who can save us, forgive us, fill us with His Holy Spirit. Believe in Jesus. Have you ever had the wind knocked out of you? I remember once in football, it might have been when my brother Joel hit me, who was sitting right here this morning. But I remember being laid out, and the first thing when you're at the wind knocked out of you is the you panic, right? You're scared. <laughs> you can't get breath in. And you need again to get that air inside. I suggest to you that though Jesus was raised from the dead, the disciples had had the wind knocked out of them. They were uncertain of what to do. They were afraid. They were bewildered. They were dealing with regret. And some of them doubted. Well, let's back up a little bit. Have you ever had the wind knocked out of you figuratively in the journey of life? Where you're scared. Where the enthusiasm is gone where it's like you can't breathe because you're uncertain of what life will hold for you. Bewildered about what might be in front of you. About fear. Can you tell me what is it that causes people to be afraid? Just say it out. Unknown. Unknown. Anything else? Really, just one? I think about, yes, the unknown, but I think about health, I think about finances, I think about my children, my grandchildren, I think about the future, I think about the adversity of the challenge that might be in my life right now. All kinds of things cause fear. Some of you I know are farmers, we're related to agriculture. I just heard this week an amusing story of a farmer who gets up tight every year in the spring when it's planting time. He's afraid that he won't get his crop in. And his wife, with a big smile on her face and her tongue in her cheek, says, I swear, in the planting season, if anything happened to me or I died, he'd put me in the freezer until planting was done. <laughs> That's a certain kind of fear, right? I remember when the Lee Lobby family was camping at Lake of the Woods in a tent. And there was a black bear that thought we invited him to dine with us every <laughs> evening. And he would stand just into the woods. We could see him standing there, sniffing the breeze because he liked what Denise was cooking. One day when we were out fishing, the bear came in to our campgrounds in his jaw, clamped onto our big food box, and drug it off into the woods. So being Davy Crockett, you know, I got my hatchet out and put it under my pillow. <laughs> I thought, well, if he comes after us in the middle of the night, I'm going to take care of him. <laughs> what is it that causes you fear that knocks the wind out of you? Or are there moments where, even though you say, I believe Jesus is alive from the dead, you're bewildered. What am I supposed to do with life now? How am I supposed to move ahead? Though the disciples did believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, there they were in locked room together, immovable or un unmobile, yeah. not acting. What are we supposed to do now? 
Okay, he's raised from the dead, but what are we supposed to do? Because didn't he call us to work for his kingdom? And isn't it true also that every one of those disciples had failed Jesus? And so they were dealing probably with a sense of guilt and even shame still that they had deserted him when they, he needed the most, or Peter in his denial. And again, I wonder, isn't it true that you and I can relate? That we believe that Jesus is raised from the dead, but we're fully aware of all those things in our past, like ghosts of regret that haunt our consciousness of what we wish had never happened, or the ongoing battles of that which is a part of our human sinful. And it can lock us away. It can paralyze us so that we don't get into action as a part of the kingdom of God. And yes, we do in this scripture text talk about doubting Thomas. The truth is, it wasn't even doubt. It was more like full-blown unbelief. The moment you stomp your foot and say, unless, the moment you pound your fist in your hand and say, unless, 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 I'm not going to, you're in unbelief. But in fairness to Thomas, you remember that when we read the gospel last week on Easter morning, every one of the disciples refused to believe the report and the witness of the women who came from the tomb. It says in several of the gospels, but they did not believe him. It sounded like an idle tale. So it's true, actually, that all of them did not believe until Jesus appeared to them and showed his presence to them as the victorious Lord raised from the dead. Sometimes it is a struggle to believe. And sometimes even we who gather as the body of Christ, as Christians, might profess a conceptual belief that Jesus died and rose again, that he's the Son of God, but we lose the sense of the immediacy of the presence of Jesus sharing the journey of life with us. I don't know if I believe, but it's true. We might want. But what's beautiful to me is how Jesus responds. He is raised from the dead. The stone is rolled away. He's loose. He's not dead. He's alive. And he's loose in his power. And what does he do as the resurrected one? He seeks out his disciples to reconnect with them, to not only kindle a faith in an awareness of his being raised from the dead, but to call them to re-engage in the work of the kingdom of God. So how does Jesus do that? I think it's amazing and it's beautiful that Jesus comes through the walls and locked doors and appears to them. What it says to me is, whatever it is that has you and I with the wind not thought of us, fear, doubt, bewilderment, failure, Jesus Christ comes through that which imprisons us to meet us again. And he doesn't come to us with some attitude of scolding or impatience, but with eagerness and invitation of love, says, what do you need to do to believe that I am alive and there for you? So he shows them his hands and his side. I believe that he did that not only to prove his identity as Jesus that they had walked with, now raised from the dead, but that he did it to demonstrate that he is the victorious one. That in fact it is his wounds that he took upon himself that allow him to promise you and me that there is nothing that can separate us from his love. He is a victorious Lord. And that as it says in Romans 8, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. He showed them his hands and his feet. But isn't it interesting, Thomas never did touch his wounds. He just 
he fell down before him. But I also love the fact that three times in the Gospel, Jesus looks at those who were clueless, who had deserted him, who had failed him, and said, He will. He will. Isn't it true that there are moments in the journey where you and I need to hear Jesus Christ say, Lave, peace. And Jesus says it again to you this morning. Whatever's going on in your life, I am the resurrected Son of God. Peace. And that the whole of the experience brings Thomas and the disciples to renewed faith. But there's one more thing. Remember I asked you, what knocks the wind out of you? What did Jesus do when he appeared to them? It says that he, he breathed on them and they received his Holy Spirit. You remember the creation story where God formed from the dirt Adam. And it says in the Hebrew, the term is ruah. Try and say that with me. On the count of three. One, two, three. Ruah. You've got to get a little in there. <laughs> it means that God fills us with the Spirit. So what was lost or diminished because of the fall of the created beauty of humanity, now with the resurrected Lord who has come to earth to recreate us in His image and empower us for life, that Jesus Christ comes to you and breathes His Spirit into you. You're not alone. And you're not impotent. And you're not clueless. And you're not powerless. Because Jesus Christ comes to where you are and breathes the spirit that conquered death into your body. Do you believe that? So Jesus Christ comes to us to recreate us. So what then is faith? Thomas, in seeing Jesus, said, my Lord and my God. One definition of faith might be that we live in the conscious awareness of what is true. And I stress the first word, that we live in that truth. That Jesus is alive. That He loves us infinitely. That He forgives all our sin. That He indwells these bodies. We're not alone. We're forgiven. We're empowered. One might also say that faith is a continual state of receiving what Jesus wants to give. And faith is always relational. So you could use three P's. That we believe certain principles, we believe certain promises, but most importantly, we believe in a living person. So if I say to you in principle, God in the name of Jesus has conquered death, and given us eternal life. That's a principle. And I could say, I believe it. If God says, in Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven you. That's a promise. And I could say, I believe it. But realize that faith, trust, is always a relational term. So it invites us into the intimacy of a conscious awareness of the living God. And your life is connected to Him by faith. So it is a misconception to say that this story is only about faith coming alive in you. It's about Jesus coming to where you are and wanting to fill you again with His Holy Spirit and establish anew His connection with you so that in His name you have life. There was a man who had a chocolate lab, hunting dogs, beautiful animal. He loved the dog. They were out hunting one day, and in the woods they came on a porcupine. Before he could call his dog back, that dog had tangled with the porcupine, and what do you think happened? He had quills in his nose and his fur all over. When he got home, they went right home. The dog was obviously in pain. But the dog trusted his master so much 
that though it hurt, one by one, the master removed those potent tranquillas from that chocolate lab rock. Sometimes my faith requires that I trust Jesus to the point that he comes to pull out the stuff that's stuck in me that continues to infect my body and wound me. But because I trust him, the pain of the removal is a necessary element to my and your becoming the people. Jesus living in the truth that he's raised from the dead. At Wolf Lake, where the family sometimes vacations, sometimes from west to east, and our cabin faces the west, the waves can roll right toward the beach, especially as you watch big thunderheads mount up in the west and then come across the lake. Well, often in those thunderstorms, if our children, when they were small, went to bed, the thunder and the lightning and the wind might awaken them as those white cats rolled onto the beach and the thunder would rumble. And they would come out to where mom and dad were still awake, sitting. And if they crawled up in our lap, they could go right back to sleep. That's crap. And sometimes our faith in the midst of the adversities of life needs to climb up under the lap of our Heavenly Father and say, God, the storm's too big. It's too powerful for me. Life is overwhelming. But I can rest in you. Walt Landgren, the fine Lutheran theologian, teacher, pastor, writer, in his book, From Morning to Dancing, tells the story of when he was a boy, there was a cherry tree outside the parsonage where they lived. And the first crook of branches, he said, was about 10 feet over the ground. He said, it was my hiding place. He said, I would shinny up, and there was a crook of a branch where I could sit against the main trunks, and I could read, and the leaves hid me. So dad or mom would even come and call me. And he said, I felt, I felt really crafty because they didn't even know where I was. Until one day, sitting up in that tree reading, a big storm came up, and literally before I knew it, because I was in the leaves, the wind knocked the book out of my hand as I was reading. And the force of the wind was so strong, I had to grip the trunk of the tree with my arms and try to wrap my legs around it. But I couldn't hold it. And my dad came outside and started to yell my name. And he said, I yelled, Daddy! And Dad saw my head hanging down behind, underneath the branches. And he came out, and I was so relieved when Grant said, I thought he was going to climb up in the tree and rescue me. But instead, he came underneath the tree, held his arms up, and said, Jump, son. <laughs> and after a few moments, Wangren said, I was so desperate. I did. And my father's arms were strong enough to catch me. Jesus comes right where you are. When the wind's been knocked out of you, or you're overwhelmed with your sense of failure, or you're struggling with it, He shows you His hands to His side, and He breathes on you to fill you up with His Spirit. And our response that the Lord hopes for is for you and I to say, My Lord, As we sing together, we offer to God our gift.